going to do some lectures on differential forms. And uh, from the point of view of we've just finished a standard multivariable basic vector calculus class, and we want to know how to do things better. And um, here's some hints that there is a better way to do things at least from the way uh, I run the class, some things that we've seen. Um, one is that when we have a function f and we take its gradient, we think of that as a vector field. And so that's assigning to every point in space a column vector, uh, f sub x, f sub y, f sub z. I'm going to do this all in three dimensions for a while, but then we'll switch and see what ha happens in two, and then the big payoff is when we go to more than three dimensions later. Because um, we know that when we write things as, as arrows, we really should be thinking of those as column vectors. We know that from a little bit of linear algebra that we know. But the trouble is, that's just really the wrong way to put these derivatives together. Because the right way to put these derivatives together is the matrix of derivatives. And since this is a function from R3 to R, then the matrix of derivatives should be exactly the same kind of function, just a linear function. And that's a row vector, fx, fy, fc. Those are just the partials. Partial f, partial x, just the, you know, the simple way to write that without the partial derivative symbol. OK, so that, uh, that might seem like a minor issue, but that's one of the hints that we're kind of thinking about this wrong that a vector field seems to suggest to be a column vector, and yet the matrix of derivatives, which we know is really good because it works with a chain rule really well. And believe me, that's really significant. So that's one hint that we're doing something wrong. And a related hint is the geometry of the gradient. Now you might think, wow, the geometry of the gradient, that was one of the coolest things about it. But there's a couple of things that are a little bit weird about that, OK? So for example, uh, if I look at f of x, y, z, actually, you know what, I, I lied. Let's just go to two dimensions real quick. It's going to be easier to draw the picture. f of x, y is uh, just x squared plus y squared, very standard example I always come back to. Then if I draw the level sets, usually the best picture for that is the level sets. So here's level set with level 1. Level 2 is actually at root 2. Level 3 is even a little tighter, closer to that. Level 4. These guys are getting closer together, as we know. That's indicating steeper. OK. And so the horizontal separation between the levels is getting smaller. But what happens to the gradient vector? We get bigger. The gradient here is uh, 2x, 2y, OK? Or, again, I really should be writing it as a column vector if I'm thinking of it as a vector field. And that gets bigger. So at 1, 0, it's uh, 2, comma, 0. But then out here, it's actually bigger. And that's a little bit odd that the spacing gets smaller when the arrows get bigger. It would be more natural if, as the spacing got smaller, the arrows got smaller. But it seems backwards. And that's actually another hint, believe it or not, that something's wrong, although it's not something you'd think is horrible. There's another thing that's going on here, which is that um, these, the size of these arrows, you can't actually just look at this picture and the size of this arrow and calculate the crucial thing that you want without some extra information. A, lot, a big job of the gradient is that the gradient dotted with some uh, vector, like a unit vector, is supposed to be the directional derivative of the function in that direction. And the problem is, if I just have this red arrow being the gradient, then it's really hard without one extra piece of information, and that is a scale on the picture, to actually do that process. So for example, if this is. Um, a vector that I want to be taking the directional derivative, I want to say, what's the directional derivative in this direction? Then, oh, actually, let me use green. 
then I need to tell you a scale on this picture. I need to actually put some marks. I have to put like the one here to do that. And you might think, well, of course I need a scale. But you know what? We're actually going to find a way where we don't really need a scale in order to do that. Um, and it's related to this fact that the arrows are getting bigger when, when really something should be getting smaller when these separations are getting smaller. Okay. So even though there's a lot of cool things we already know about the geometry of the gradient, there's this one feature that's kind of backwards. Okay. So that was the second hint. I don't know if I put a number two on that. The third hint that we've seen, this black really runs out so quickly. Let me go to blue. Um, is the differential notation for line integrals. So usually in vector calculus, when I teach this, I usually like, for if we have a curve, C, like this, oriented, of course, and that's going to be very, very important. Orientation is going to be very important throughout this. And then I have a vector field that I want to integrate along that curve. I like the geometric way to write it, f dot dr, because it's very visual. It's got these arrows and everything. But I observe in another video that when you actually calculate that, let's say f is pi plus qj plus rk, you actually get down to parameterizing it from a to b p dx dt plus q dy dt plus r dz dt, all times dt. And that's what happens if you parameterize it, and the dr turns into the components of the velocity, and the f turns into the p q r. And we've observed <coughs> that you can kind of halfway go back to an abstract formulation by just formally canceling the dt's. And so this is a notation our book uses a lot, a notation you, you see a lot, the differential notation for line integrals. So far, it's been just a notation. It's just, ah, it's a notational convenience. If I tell you this, it gives you exactly the same information as what seems to be a more geometric concept, but it's closer. It's just one quick step away from how you actually run it through the parameterization procedure. Well, now we're actually going to say, no, this is really, there is actually a geometric and conceptual meaning to this expression. This guy is going to be a differential form, a differential one form, in fact. And uh, <coughs> what we're going to do is we're going to upgrade it, promote it from being just a notation and a, and a convenience to something that has real meaning and, and real geometry associated to it. And it's still going to have the big advantage that it's notationally very close to the, this procedure. And in fact, we're going to realize that the no what seemed to be just a notational convenience was that this kind of expression more naturally relates to things like the chain rule. The reason this is really happening is with parameterizations. It's all about combining with the function x of t, y of t, z of t. That's really a chain rule kind of operation, composition. And um, differential forms respect that in an in incredibly natural way. And that's related to what I was saying at the first hint about row vectors versus column vectors and the matrix of derivatives. Um, it's going to be a little bit of a different issue, and we're going to wait to actually apply this hint, but I'll, I'll put it right now. Um, number four, in three dimensions, there's the curl of a vector field. And so, you know, we have a vector field. Well, let's just put it in blue. Maybe it's going around like this, you know, it's sort of in a plane. And then the curl, we define it as this other vector that pops out this way. Curl f, if this one was f. And one of the things you might not know, but one of the things we did in class, and I, I'm not sure if I had a video about this, is that really the fundamental property of the curl, the reason it fits into Stokes' theorem, the, the start of my proof of Stokes' theorem, well, I didn't invent it, but the one I like, is that if we have a tiny little parallelogram and we find the circulation around that parallelogram, let's say, well, a parallelogram has a certain area. Let's call it, think of it as tiny, so it's ds, a scalar. Oh, but then we want to also remember how it's oriented, so we'll just promote it to be ds, the vector. Then um, the, the fact is that curl f dot ds exactly measures the local circulation of a vector field around that little boundary of the, rec uh, the parallelogram uh, per unit area. 
Oh, actually, it's just the local circulation because I've defined. I've actually multiplied it by the area. It's really just the local circulation around this parallelogram. And Stokes' theorem basically is just um, putting integrals in front of both sides of that. The integral of that is going to be the sum of all the local circulations, which is the global circulation. That's Stokes' theorem. Why is this a hint of that something's wrong? Turns out curl F really shouldn't be a vector field because it's not really, um, I'm doing something a little artificial and something we do a lot. It's a trick that we don't really need to do and we're going to see why we don't need to do it, but we have been doing it. And that's saying, okay, here's curl F, a vector, and here's the DS vector perpendicular to this little surface element. Well, it's really, the curl F is really wanting to, to eat the surface element itself. It's, it's kind of artificial to think of it as eating this vector. This vector isn't actually the thing that's, ha that's happening in here. It's really this parallelogram. And it's really sort of the combination of these two vectors that make the parallelogram. That's really what this object should be eating. But we don't have something that naturally kind of swallows up two vectors and produces a number, the local circulation. But we will. It's going to turn out to be a differential two form. OK, so I know this is kind of a weird way to start, um, but I wanted to put a lot of uh, background in as to why we might need something else. Oh, there's even one more hint related to the curl. Um, when we do a flux integral, this is related to my, the previous hint. We had the differential notation for line integrals, but we don't really have a similar notation to the, the differential notation for line integrals that applies to flux integrals over a surface. It be, might be nice to have that. Because there is actually a fairly in involved procedure for doing any kind of flux integral. You have to do this cross product of the RU cross RV stuff, and it's a, it's a bit of a pain. Now, we're not actually going to get, us, get out of that kind of calculation, but we're going to see better why that has to happen when we invent a similar notation to flux integrals to this incredibly convenient one, the differential notation for line integrals. Okay, so um, let me go ahead and, pa and just break it into another video and we'll actually get down to what are differential forms, or at least the start of it, and do some examples.